seven over sir. Bringing Coralio and uh, uh, set up for us. We have three of our beloved team rhythm engineers, uh, Brian's, the Brian's, Brian and Brian, and <laughs> Ayaz. Been talking about some great stuff. My name is uh, Sandra Pasquale. I run the web engineering practice at, at IR. Probably a lot of you uh, do web engineering. I have hosts. Probably a lot of interest to some of you. Maybe even Cobb. Um, I'm interested in learning and growing. I'm interested in teaching people. I've written a few books. Uh, our whole company is focused on making people better. Uh, the mic, is, can you guys hear the mic on? What's that? The yeah. mic, I don't think the mic's on. The mic's not on, but I have a loud booming voice. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. 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 It's because you're, you're eating pizza, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Is the mic not on? Okay. Can you turn it on? Can I just switch? So we're just in learning and growth. So like our people work at some of the best companies in the world working on systems that are massive. Uh, do you want to be part of the team that say changes the way that hundreds of millions of people get their mortgages, uh, the, way, the way DevOps happens when you want to have to scale to thousands of servers. This is the company that, allows, that places you in those places and you will learn uh, how to be uh, a great engineer uh, working at in rhythm. So um, if any of you are interested in learning more about that, please uh, reach out to me afterwards. Uh, but I just want to get started. Uh, we have these great speakers coming in. I want to introduce uh, David Sapno first, who will give a few words and then introduce the kind of uh, timeline. And uh, again, uh, thanks to our guys who have stepped up and are, are going to show you how great uh, our, our guys are. Uh, thanks. Thank you. 
brand new plugins, brand new, uh, uh, brand new products like a uh, Go Land, I think that's what it's called, and uh, App Code. That's their, you know, competitor VS Code. It's all built in Kotlin. So the reason why they uh, needed this is because every time they would create an IDE, they would take this giant Java base and to add a feature was kind of like uh, adding features to Windows 98. Not, it's not going to happen, and no one's going to do that. So, uh, also, the biggest issue was take all of that Java code and make Colin easy to understand. So, they started in 2010. 1.0 released in 2016. So, it's a long project, long, a lot of jurisdictions. So, uh, what ended up happening is today, uh, as of today, version 1.3 is currently available, and it's open source, and you can totally download it. So, talk about the why make the switch. So one of the big events is in Google I.O. for 2017, Android said, we're scrapping Java. All new features are going to be built using Kotlin. And I thought it was a joke. Because I was like, why would you why would you divorce? That's a happy marriage. Java, Android, why would you do that? So if you go to uh, Android Studio, download it, let's use the new navigation components. It makes building entire UIs a lot easier. It's not supportable Java. So if you click Java on your project, it will just remove it for you, and then you're just sitting there with a the messed up Gradle script. And yeah, that's a problem. But still, at the same time, the, the great thing about that is it shows the commitment to what Kotlin is. Also, large frameworks like Spring, uh, if you go to uh, for GoTo Conference, uh, they had an entire talk about building an entire Spring service without annotations. And uh, it's using Kotlin as an engine to build a domain specific language, and you just build the service that way. There's also uh, Kotlin JS, and uh, they also bring out how you can make React apps that tie into a Kotlin backend, or using Kotlin to functionally build their UIs. Then Kotlin Data, which is my favorite, is allowing Kotlin to be embedded into systems similar to uh, MicroPython, which is used for uh, microcontrollers, and definitely popular in the Raspberry Pi space. So Kotlin Native using, it uses LLVM. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it uses that as an engine to uh, drive functions and controls. But my number one favorite thing, it is also a marker in the world of Java that verbosity is dying. Uh, anyone who uses ES6 in, in JavaScript and TypeScript, anyone who uses new Python 3 methods, anyone that uses even new Rails and Ruby code, the, the days of us writing a wall of code, that, marriage in our software lives is gone. So uh, I'm also welcoming it because Colin is really awesome at handling this. So my favorite thing to do every time I start a Spring database is to scope it. So we're going to build a bookstore, and it's going to have three things, a title, a price, and uh, an ISBN number. So the first thing we're going to do is with object mapping, that's going to be the first topic. The second one is going to be our Common components, constructors, uh, sorry, uh, controllers, uh, services, repositories, how you do that in Colin and dependency injection, which is pretty important. And uh, my favorite topic is going to be testing, which is going to be last, and that's going to be the surprise. So, this is Java. We have a public class that a few properties, you know, title, price, and that is a constructor. I had to change the font of this code several times for it to fit on one slide. <laughs> this is the getters and setters, our favorite getters and setters. So this is what we press shift insert for, and IntelliJ does it for us. This is, uh, this is fun. And then, last but not least, our favorite methods. I had to take a picture of this. I couldn't even <laughs> fit it on with size of the font. This is our equals method for comparison. This is our hash code. And this is also our two-string method, just for debugging and handling things going forward. Everyone ready to see how you do this in Kotlin? Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's how you do it in Kotlin. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't fit on the page, so I had to add memes, you know, you know, content. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is Kotlin, and, and what Kotlin has done is encapsulated things we all do. We don't constantly have to write equals method. We don't have to constantly have to write two-string methods. We know we want to do two-string method. Show me all the properties. This is what I'm going to push out in the logger. That's the things that we want to, to do with Kotlin. So I think that's a good cover of how easy it is to do object modeling. And uh, you know, my
my next favorite portion is common components. So we have controllers, repositories, service configuration, and these are things that we all generally do. Now, Kotlin doesn't remove annotations, so sorry, you have to still write your annotation and configurations for your MongoDB. You still have to do it for your Hibernate. You still have to do all of those things. However, assignments to functions is something that allows us to write less code and to make it a lot easier to, to view. So uh, I think we can just go right into uh, that is this. So this is a REST controller. And this is for customers. And let's say we want to get all of our customers. The first thing is our find all method. That is Kotlin and not Java. And what's amazing about that is I don't have to write return. I don't have to use braces. Your linter's not going to complain. Uh, your get mapping. And it's the same code, but it's easier to just translate over to something else. Um, at the same time, uh, if you look at the constructor, repository and it's just thrown in there. There's no need for auto wire because Spring, I think as of 4.3, anything that's passed in a constructor is automatically auto wire. So you don't, so in other words, think about how many races and return statements you have in your code. On Kotlin Wing's own website, they admitted once they made this change and added it to the, to the language, all of their code base has decreased by 40%. So you're reading less code, you're getting to the point quicker, and you know, gone are the days of just a wall of code. And you go, well, I'm going to be ramping up for two weeks, and your poor documentation doesn't help. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's how that moves. And our last topic is going to be on testing. So testing is really important to me. Uh, my last client site, I was performance testing. I've never done it before. Easily, I, I've never understood why testers do what they do, because it just seems like the most annoying thing in the world. Uh, hey, hit this service, pop in your time, just tell me those numbers. Like, it just seems like the worst job in the world. But I tried it, and you know, I have to say, it is easily one of the funnest things in the world to just point out flaws, and it makes you a better developer. But with the rise of testing, testing has opened up a framework, or I would say, a usage of practices just everywhere. So there's functional tests, end-to-end -end tests, end-to-end -end performance tests, acceptance tests, and what you end up with is, you know, at the bottom point, card service no property 480 <laughs> status. I know I'm not that's a short test. That's a short test. I think we can all admit that's a short test thing. So when working with Kotlin, one of the, my favorite things is how testing works. So this is a test, a simple Java, a Java test, and now we can actually just use words to describe our test. We can tie a Jira ticket to a test, a test case with an ID number. We can tie all of these things directly to our test. So if something fails or flows not working, we have a direct reference such that we know what happens. And this is easily my favorite feature so far. It works perfectly with anything in Spring, uh, Spring Boot Test, Spring Runner. It's fully supported as of Spring 2.210. I think that's the latest. And uh, last but not least, very much, everyone. Uh, told you it's going to be quick, right? <laughs> so uh, that is in Rhythms uh, blog, and we constantly push out content Tuesdays and I think Wednesdays, and that's our Instagram, uh, Code uh, Oleo. You can find them on Facebook, and that's my blog, Human Caching, and it's basically me just trying stuff out every weekend because, you know, my kid goes outside. So that's <laughs> 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 that, that's that. And, um, What's the performance like? Can you do performance wise? Okay, so one thing I have noticed is um, using Kotlin is also kind of tied to how you build your code. So please stop using Maven. Um, <laughs> that's the, the lesson I've learned. Um, from a performance standpoint, my services for Kotlin have all booted up much faster than my Java ones. Uh, dependency injection being the default without Java having to go and build constructors in the way Kotlin immediately handles uh, creating those singletons and then booting up your service. Alone, I've noticed a performance difference when building something simple in Java and simple in Kotlin. I prefer Kotlin over Java easily. Yes? Do you think of anything that Java is better than Kotlin? Um, 
Um, okay, I have a weird love hate relationship with stack traces. I think that Java stack traces have such a hierarchy and like such a history to them. I right now prefer Java stack trace, where Kotlin they come out the same, but finding where the error is and maybe that that root error, it's a little difficult sometimes, but because it's less code, it's less places that you could have made that mistake. So you know, it's kind of like intuitively going, okay, I totally did, I totally set that to null. <laughs> and I'm null checking right there. I didn't try to put the try catch around this. Um, and that's the main uh, crux of what, what I found, why Java, I like Java a little more. Oh, and uh, the changes for Java 12, I like the optional class um, over pattern matching. Because Java 12 is basically they're taking Kotlin, taking uh, Scala, they're just taking features from a bunch of other languages. And Kotlin has a, uh, I don't know, let's see, anyone a fan of Erlang or Elixir in here? There's like a, a way of pattern matching such that you can say, oh, this type, then execute some code. Java has a, a, uh, has a, a version of that such that it's like it's called an optional. It's, it, oh, you know what? JavaScript, so it's like a truthy method, like a truthy object, such that, oh, if it's here, then do something, like in TypeScript, sorry, TypeScript, TypeScript. it's like, oh, if it's here, then do something, and that's kind of what an optional is. It's, it's much more robust in Java 12 than it is in Kotlin right now, but yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what that's like in the next version of Kotlin in two weeks or something. Uh, any more questions? Well, thank you very much. I really do My name is Brian Moore. I've been with uh, In Rhythm for uh, about six months. Um, it's not on there. I know. I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to talk while I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ad living here. All right. Um, I uh, had bought into the. I can't see my slide, but um, I bought into the orange. So I'm wearing my uh, orange In Rhythm today. So um, uh, I am. Uh, uh, I've had a great time since I've been here. Like I said, for for six months. I'm um, uh, formally. Uh, IBM, Boeing, and ADP, so I've worked in some pretty large places, and uh, it's kind of nice to have a, a tight little uh, family here. Um, Did you do like the software for 737 Max? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <Yeah. laughs> a lot of questions to the end. <laughs>
software industry, um, and it's really bothered me, um, especially if I have two younger kids that I want to bring into the industry because I mean, we have sweet perks, right? So um, <laughs> my kids have come to like take your kid to work day, and they're like, Dad, you just play games all day? And I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. Um, so you should come. Uh, so you should learn all the Kotlins of the world and, and figure things out. Um, but uh, before I dive into it, um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, April Wenzel, who is somebody that I saw speak um, about a year ago at um, NG Atlanta. Um, she gave a talk about um, uh, she gave a talk about compassion um, within our coding practices and, and how we work and how we interact with people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it really struck me because I was when I saw the title of the talk, I was like. What's she talking about? Why? Why am I? Why do I even care about this? And afterwards, I was like, Oh my God, we're all jerks to each other. Okay. Um, and so, it, like I said, it really resonated with me. And so, um, she has a Twitter. She started a company called Compassionate Coding, where she goes and talks to companies and uh, really gets them to sort of change their mindset about how they think and how they operate, how they work together uh, as a team. So she also does a talk about compassionate code reviews, which sounds a lot like compassionate pull requests. I promise I didn't copy it, and she'll do a much better job of talking about it than I will, but I'll kind of give you the, uh, the cheap Brian Lurie version. <laughs> um, so uh, let's start off uh, with this guy. Um, people probably recognize this guy, uh, Linus Torvalds, as the uh, creator of Linux. Um, I thought it was interesting on Google that he his title is software engineer. I'm like, I kind of think he's a little bit more than that. Um, and, and that's really sort of the point, right? So. He's uh, idealized or idolized by many people as, wow, he created something in Linux, um, and also Git, by the way, um, that has changed changed our lives. It certainly changed mine, right? Um, I found out <coughs> uh, after reading a little bit about him that um, the, uh, the Linux kernel, not only for all the distributions of Linux that we know of, um, but it was also part of Android and part of um, Chrome OS, um, which I didn't realize. Um, so, Pretty cool. So, software engineer is kind of a you know baseline. I'm like, I'm like, wait, I'm a software engineer too. So, should I be up there? Um, but uh, uh, how many people are aware of uh, Linus's rants on code reviews and such? Okay, I see a couple of hands. So that I didn't have to put that bottom picture in there, but that's mm -hmm. kind of like his persona um, and what uh, a lot of people know him for. So, yes, he's brilliant. Um, he is. Probably borderline genius, if, uh, in my opinion. Um, but he he doesn't he has an interesting way of treating people. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna walk through this real quick to set it as an example. So um, this was something that was posted to the uh, Linux kernel mailing list. Um, I'll let you read on your own. But essentially, he's not being very nice to somebody who's kind of stuck, right? Somebody got stuck and said, "There's no way I can continue with this," um, and he kind of lost his mind and, and went off on the guy. Um, so. You know, feel free, I don't know how many swear words are in that, so I'm just gonna skip past that. Um, but the, the sense is that, you know, this is a person that is um, uh, idolized by many, and uh, you know, doesn't treat people very nicely. And that struck me as like, oh, something has to be done about this. So um, what's actually um, very inspiring for me is that in, uh, in September of last year, the uh, Linux kernel group changed what they had they had something called their code of uh, conflict. So you know, you guys are familiar with codes of conduct, right? Well, code of conflict, a meeting is like, all right, let's go. You know, um, it immediately bring like animosity to the, to the idea. Um, and they changed it to a code of conduct, which is much more inclusive. You see words like uh, empathy, you see words like respect. Um, so they're, they're trying to change their culture. And um, on the same day that this was merged, um, Linus sent out, publicly, and I give him a lot of credit for this, sent out a message saying, hey, I've been a jerk. I'm gonna take some time off and, and rethink how I've treated people. Um, which, you know, if the you know genius guy that created um, created Git, created uh, the Linux kernel, can come out in public and state this, the rest of us can do a little bit better too, right? Um, so I kind of use this as a launching point of, you know, if somebody of this stature um, can do this, we can all do a little bit better. Um, so <clears throat> I got into computers because, um, I guess because I'm a geek, but uh, you know, one of the things
things I really, I've never been a very creative person. Um, so I don't, you know, I color within the lines. I use the right colors, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I really felt like when I was able to program, this is, you know, when I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, um, it was great because my stuff either worked or didn't. And I love that, right? There was stuff works, okay, cool. I'll move on to the next thing. Doesn't work, okay, what did I do wrong? And it was on me. I, I knew um, right or wrong, black and white, zero or one. That was great. I love that. Um, over the years, I've learned that's not always the case, right? There, there's some gray area. Um, and in particular, you know, just because something's done um, a different way doesn't mean that it's a wrong way. Or a different way than I would have done it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. In fact, there's a lot of there's been a lot of cases in uh, in my history where. I thought I had the best answer, and somebody else came with something like out of left field, and I was like, what is this? Talk, talk to me, show me, walk me through this, because this is not anything I've ever even tried before. Um, this looks really cool, and oh, it's also 10 times faster than what I wrote? Okay, sweet. Um, so, you know, having that, having that openness um, is something that I've learned um, along the way. So, <clears throat> quick definitions here. Um, I talked about compassion. Um, one of the things that uh, I think about Look this up on Google, so it should look familiar. Um, is you know what kind of person do I want my team to think that I am? Um, and I particularly look at the antonyms, right? Indifferent, uh, heartless. I don't want anybody to think that of me ever, right? Um, heartless is like well, one thing, but indifferent, like I don't care, like I don't have time to even give a give a, <laughs> uh, give a crap about the work that you've done. So indifferent is terrible. At least have an opinion, right? Tell me that you don't agree with this, or that you you know you think that this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, but give me something. Um, another word that we talked about was uh, empathy, right? The the Linux kernel uh, code of uh, conduct talked about being empathetic. Now empathetic empathy gets confused a lot with sympathy. So empathy is really uh, understanding and uh, the feelings of somebody else. Versus sympathy is like you feel bad for the situation that they're in. Right? We're not sympathetic because you wrote that code, right? Or that you've had a, um, a tough, maybe, well, I guess you can be sympathetic about someone having a, a tough life or a bad break or something like that. But, you know, really internalizing it, feeling it yourself. Um, and, and really what you want to do is have this feeling of togetherness, right? And, you know, this is a lot of, it's a bit fluffy, so I'm, I'm going to give you some concrete examples here. Um, but, again, we're all in this uh, together, right? When you're reviewing somebody's code, whether it's, in the open source community or within your own uh, company, there's uh, a point at which you have to realize that we're all doing, we're all headed in the same direction. So let's, you know, boost each other up and let's, um, uh, you know, work together. So uh, pull request reviews. To me, pull request reviews are the the point. If you're not parent, um, are the point at which communication is uh, very important. Um, probably the most crucial point. So. Um, a lot of people work on remote teams. I have at least one remote person that they work with. Um, you know, text uh, text messaging. You know, versus you know video and stuff like that. Words can be just, um, uh, understood completely differently from your target audience than um, what you're the point you're trying to get across. So um, you have to put a lot of uh, what I'm saying is put a lot of thought into your uh, into your pull request comments. Um, so as you're reviewing something, you have the ability. You can be ruthless, right? Are you gonna destroy this person's pull request because last week he got you? Okay, sure. Um, are you gonna nitpick about all of the um, semicolons that are in the wrong place or the spacing around parentheses? Um, no. Let's get a linter going. You don't have to torture somebody over their uh, their spacing issues. Um, or you know, are you gonna be kind? Are you gonna be helpful? Are you gonna tell them, hey, this this was. Uh, um, this was the way that we used to do things here, and here's some information about how we do things now, um, and really point somebody in the right direction um, and give them encouragement. Um, remember, the person who makes the pull request is at your mercy as a reviewer. So they're putting themselves out there um, and showing their hard work. Nobody likes their stuff to be openly criticized. So think about the empathy part of it and get yourself in their shoes and how they might take feedback. Um, so let, let's look at some pull request comments that I made on my own repo to myself. <laughs> um, so uh, this this is something that you see a lot. What about zero? Yeah. Uh, what about? Like, give me something. I mean, immediately I'm like, like yeah. What about? Like, I want to put my 
this up and I'm ready to go. Um, so that's not really useful, right? That, that's really giving somebody, uh, you know, not enough time. I, I think it comes down to time. So what's, what's the next one? This won't work when it's zero. Yeah, what won't work? Like, hey, thanks for making an entire sentence, but it's not really helpful. Um, uh, you know, when, when what's zero? What do you mean it doesn't work? Um, how about, I think you know, need another test case for when val is zero. Okay, now, now we're getting somewhere, right? We're being specific about what we didn't like. Um, uh, and the, but not only that, we're leading them towards what our initial intention was. When we said, what about zero? I was thinking in the back of my head, I, I wish they wrote a test for this, um, but I didn't say that. So why didn't I say that? I didn't have a lot of time. I had to do a quick, uh, quick code review, and then I had uh, five other meetings I had to go to. Um, but instead of having ten questions be asked about that and, and a full thread going below that, if you just simply added a few more words and stated your intentions, it makes a big difference. Um, so I have homework for you. Sorry, we'll be checking it next week. Um, I hopefully you've all heard the, heard the golden rule of treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, I came across this version of it, which is someone called the titanium rule. I, you know, I don't get into that stuff, but I think it's an interesting way to think about it, right? Some people like to be given feedback as if they were a computer, right? Fix this. You did that wrong. Okay, great. There's other people that you know are um, maybe don't know and they want to learn, so kind of pull them along, give them some, uh, give them some thoughtful. Feedback. There's people that you've worked with for five years. You know you can give them crap on their on a pull request and they'll be fine with it. There's other people who are new to the company, new to uh, the team that you know you want to nurture and you want to show them sort of uh, the right way to do things. Um, before I go, um, you know, would Kelly would you a positive comment? Yeah, I know. Um, so hey, look at this one. Good use of Singleton. This will help me in my story. I really, you know, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. It doesn't take that much time. You know, a lot of us go into pull requests we're like, all right, I'm gonna find something, I'm gonna, you know, I'm getting this guy. Um, and the, it's, I can see you laugh, but that's kind of what happens, right? I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, right? Being an engineer, we like to look for, we like to fix things, we like to uh, create things, and we like to look for problems. So it's just natural. But, you know, as you're going through it, you're like, oh, okay, he, he's, he's, he definitely messed this up. Um, oh, no, uh, he did the right thing here. And you don't leave a comment, you just move on to the next thing. Or I'm gonna find a spacing issue or something like that. You know, she must have messed up on the, the class definition. I know it looks good, okay, I'm just move on to the next thing. Give, give some positive uh, feedback. Um, let's chat. So uh, I, um, in about uh, 24 hours, I'll be leaving to go to Jamaica, so you've got a short window here. Um, but um, I'm interested in continuing the conversation. Um, I've written a couple of blog posts on, uh, specifically on pull requests. Some of them come from uh, past uh, work experiences. Uh, and so um, you, did, you can probably relate because they are some real examples. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. One thing is, how do you balance this with the need to make sure the team is accountable for the quality of the work? Okay, so the question is, how do you balance this with um, keeping the team accountable for the work that they do? Um, are you talking in terms of uh, the time it takes to um, put in no, I mean, uh, an I mean, effort for, for a request? More when something is, uh, like I think the differentiation you made between sim sympathy and empathy is very important because a sympathetic person would say, you know what, I don't want to make him feel bad, or make her feel bad, so I'm just going to let them check in the code. <laughs> mm -hmm. And even though there may be issues with it. Um, so it's really that more, more of that, you know, how do you make sure that, you know, if, if you do give positive feedback and reinforcement and whatever, uh, that you don't see a change, you see it ignored or whatever, that mm -hmm. you, know, that you say, look, you know, I gave you solid feedback, and you didn't take it, and this is what it fit. Yes, that definitely happens, and that will happen. Um, step one is to give the positive feedback, so we've all got homework. Um, but uh, one of the things that I do, so I've, I've been in many situations where I had a lot of feedback for somebody on a pull request, and I realized after the third comment, like, whoa, whoa, wait, stop. And I take it offline. Um, so that's my recommendation, right? The 
human contact, be you know, be human to each other. Right. Um, go call them up on the phone if, if you work um, with them. Go sit next to them and walk through the pull request. Um, you can do a screen share just to go through it um, and, and really add sort of like the, the personal touch. There's going to be people that reject it outright, and I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do about that. But putting your best foot forward in that regard, I think, is is a step in the, in the right direction. Anybody else? Basically, it's a long-running process that executes the command at specific dates and times. Uh, and runs behind the scenes on the system. Uh, so basically, what does that mean? Basically, you can schedule a script to run at a specific date and time. And are, uh, are a lot of you JavaScript developers? OK, so what does that sound like? Set interval. It's very similar to set interval, but the big difference is that, well, set interval is on the board, so obviously. Uh, but set interval, uh, you you set the interval in uh, increments of milliseconds, right? Well, with a cron, you can give it a specific date to run on. So if I want my job to run on the 15th of every month, I would, it would be way more beneficial to set that up with a cron rather than a set interval and have to do the calculation of uh, how many milliseconds it is till the next 15th of the month. That sounds like a disaster. Um, and how is this different from a daemon? It's actually very similar to a daemon. Uh, they both run behind the scenes uh, and they're constantly running. Uh, but cron is kind of more specific to scheduling tasks on an interval whereas you can more easily configure a daemon. Um, okay, so why am I telling you this? Uh, crons are a great way to automate a process that you might normally do manually. For instance, sending out emails to all of your clients, maybe on the 15th of the month, uh, backing up your database. Uh, a lot of developers use cron jobs to back up their database. 
Uh, and at my work, we use crons for everything. Uh, so I work at a startup. One of our largest clients whose system we maintain is one of the, is the third largest uh, personal loans lender in the country. Uh, so they use a lot of loans for like sending out uh, loans to be funded to their uh, like GPS endpoint. Uh, what I worked on is credit monitoring. Uh, so like, when, I don't know if you have like Chase or Citibank and you go on and you check your FICO score, uh, what a lot of companies do is they batch those requests. Um, so like on the first of the month or the 15th of the month, they will send a giant request to Equifax and Equifax will give them a response with thousands of users and their FICO scores. And the way that Equifax does that is like very unsecure. Won't go into too much of that, but it's no surprise that Equifax was uh, hacked a couple years ago. They have very antiquated software, side note. <laughs> anyway, um, so the cron I wrote, it runs on the 15th of the month. It pulls all of our users' data, uh, their like first name, last name, social security number, and sends that to Equifax. We, and then that cron picks out another cron that checks an SFTP, SFTP server for Equifax's response. It then pulls that response and saves all the credit monitoring data to the database. So rather than doing that manually on the 15th of every month, we have a cron that runs on a schedule to do that. Um, same thing with our pricing. Um, for certain states like South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, and Florida, uh, pricing changes on a daily basis um, as far as like uh, what interest rate or APR you will get for your loan. So we constantly need to be pulling data from uh, this like service that provides pricing uh, every day of the month to get updated pricing. Uh, so we do that on a current schedule as well. That's actually what I'm working on right now. And it's actually going to give more favorable pricing to our customers, which I'm actually really happy about. Okay, so how do these work? Uh, so, crons have been around since the 1970s, actually. Um, and they were first developed uh, in version 7 of Unix. And basically what it was, was a program that checked the user's uh, computer, or the user's system for a file called crontab. And in the crontab file, there would be this list of commands to run at a specific interval. And what it would do is it would check that file, check to see if any uh, scripts need to be run at that minute, and then it would go to sleep for another minute, and then check again. So it would just continually be checking this file and seeing if there were any scripts that needed to be run, which was very inefficient. So uh, in the 1980s, Princeton Review, or Princeton University, did this study on this new data structure uh, called discrete event simulators. Uh, and this guy used that algorithm to say, okay, rather than checking the crontab file every minute, let's run a process that checks the crontab file, checks to see when that process is run, put that on like an event listener, and then once that uh, event is, or once that program is supposed to run, let's run that process. So rather than checking the contact file every minute, it would just check it once, record all the times, and then once those times, once that timer went off, it would run the file. And that's basically how crons work in Node. Uh, it's actually funny because there are no crons in Node really. Um, they're just event emitters. Uh, so basically you feed your interval into your program. It, reads your interval, and then it creates a set timeout for the next tick of when your script is supposed to run, and then it runs, it goes to sleep, and then it runs your program when it's supposed to go off, when the set timeout fires. Um, so kind of like a second interval, but uh, there's a lot more logic built into the specific, like, the specific node from library. Okay. So, the one
one bizarre thing about Kron's is the Kron schedule. Uh, it has this very funky syntax. Uh, so if you see in the diagram right there, uh, the five stars at the very bottom. So the first one corresponds to a minute, second one hour, third day of month, fourth month, and then the fifth is the day of the week. Um, so you feed that, you, that's like how your cron knows how to run. So if you, and star stands for running on like every possible interval. So if you fed your program this specific syntax of star, 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 your program would run every minute. And if you do five, zero, star, eight, star, it is, okay, so it's the hour is zero, which is 12, uh, and then the minute is five, so it's 12.05 a.m., and then every day on the eighth month, which is August. So it's very weird syntax, but you get used to it, um, and there are a ton of tools online. One great one is Content, Content Guru that you can kind of play around with and make sense of the syntax. But once you get a sense of that, it's very easy to use. Um, then talk a little bit about trade-offs. Um, so a lot of people don't like crons because you can't run them every second which is why you would use a set interval, but actually no cron allows support for seconds. So you, you could actually have a sixth interval and the first one then would count as the second. So you actually wouldn't need set interval, but it's a little bit more profit to set up no cron than for set interval. Uh, also logging, it's kind of hard to log inside of a cron, especially if you're not running it in JavaScript because it's running on the system, so it's hard to see if you're getting errors. But in JavaScript, you can actually can log, and you can get uh, email sent to you that says whether your cron failed or not. Um, and then, so in JavaScript, like I said, they're not actually crons, so they are running in your application, um, meaning that it's not running on the system, it's not running behind the scenes. So when your cron is running, it is uh, blocking the main thread. So you can't be running other processes while your cron is running. Um, so that's kind of like a pitfall of using uh, crons in Node. But you actually can use this library called Forever.js, which allows you to inject scripts into your program that will run forever. And you can write them in Linux, and it's actually like a real cron. So you could use that, and that would run behind, uh, that would run behind your program, so it wouldn't block the main thread. Uh, there are also other pro, uh, libraries out there other than Notecron. Uh, Note schedule is sort of similar, but it uses more relying on event emitters and the dimension forever JS. Uh, so I just want to do like a quick demonstration of Notecron. Basically, what I'm doing here is reminding myself, if it's 9 or 1 a.m. and I'm not watching Game of Thrones, to send me an email to remind me to watch Game of Thrones. Uh, and a lot of the logic at the top uh, is has to do with Node Mailer. I don't know if any of you have used Node Mailer, uh, but I'm sending an email from Rusty Shackleford983 at gmail.com which is my fake email that I use for everything, uh, and sending it to my real email and saying, why the hell aren't you watching Game of Thrones? Um, I actually got into an argument uh, with uh, MealPal, because I was using that fake email and I set up another account. This is totally off topic, but, <laughs> and they, I was like, this is a new account, like why won't you let me get my free meals? And they were like, they were like, Rusty, 
like we know that you already signed up with a good cow with the same credit card. You can't be fun to the meals. Quick aside, but. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm setting up this email to send to me to remind me to watch Game of Thrones. Uh, at the very bottom, I'm requiring a note around at the top. And then all it is is this one line of code on line 32, I feed in this interval. So it is on the first minute of the 21st hour uh, on Sunday. So zero is Sunday. And you can actually write like in plain English, say like sun, and it knows that it's Sunday. Um, but so that's what this is doing. But just to demonstrate this, I'm going to change these to actually stars. Okay, so this is going to run every minute. Start my server. And it's waiting, <laughs> waiting. I don't know what doing time and feeling fine is. It just felt right to put it. Crons are really cool. They're really easy to use in JavaScript. Uh, at work, we have like a much more complicated setup than this. <laughs> but like, if you're, I don't know, if you are, you have a small application and you want to automate some sort of process and run something on a schedule, like sending out emails or fetching data from an API at a specific time, like crons are great. And they're really easy to use. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, like we get e when there's an error on the cron service, we 
is a software engineer here at in Rhythm, currently working on Golden Sacks, I believe. And today he's going to be talking to us about React Jokes. Let's go ahead. JS. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Agaz. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about React hooks. So, uh, so there's a lot to go through, and people have been saying, I don't know if you're going to be able to finish this in 15 minutes. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's get started. What are we going to learn today? We're going to learn why hooks um, use state, use effect, use context, use reducer, and uh, redux. So, uh, why hooks? Currently, it's really hard to like break logic down and reuse them in like components. And um, using like you know lifecycle methods and everything, it can get a little complicated. So um, you know we have to use like render props and higher order functions in order to like pass information through various means, and it can get kind of messy. So um, hooks let us uh, reorder logic inside functions to reu uh, to reusable units. Um, they're 100% backwards compatible. Um, your boy, Dan Abramoff, says don't use, don't fully rewrite your code. Use them along with your existing code. So uh, thanks, Dan. Um, so let's talk about use state and uh, use effect. So um, you, um, with these two functions, you can now do, there's no need to duplicate logic. And you, the biggest thing is you have smaller code base. If you look at a class-based component compared to like Functional components using um, React hook, hooks substantially smaller. So, you, and you can create your own custom hooks to extrapolate logic and save and save to specific component states. We'll get into that in a little bit. So let's talk about new state. So this is old school state. Uh, we all know it. Um, so as you can see, this is how you set state, and it uh, sets my coolness factor. Um, <laughs> so now let's talk about new state. Um, how new state works. You have a const, and you you use uh, array deconstruction, which is very weird. Like when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh yeah, this existed." So, um, initial, so you have a getter and a setter. Count, for example, gives you the current state. Up, gives you the current state. Update counter is the setter, which sets the count, and zero is the initial state of this counter. So, um, if you look at the button down there, uh, update counter increases the count by one every time you click the button. So what happens if you console.log use state? It just gives you an op, it just gives you an array. Uh, index zero is the actual state and index one is the logic. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but like the gist of it. Um, now func uh, functions have individual states uh, what? have individual feature states that do not depend on state objects. Am I missing something? Oh right, 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 sorry. I just changed a couple things around right before the talk. Um, so, um, if you look at this uh, snippet of code, um, I have two pieces of state, very individual. They're not. It's not an. It's not a this dot state object where everything is like together. You can make pieces of state like individually, which is very cool. So um, now uh, this is this is where things start to get really cool. So if you look at um, this input value, very similar. You know, it's using use state, but you guys get the gist of it. It's, it has a uh, state value, value and on change, and when you type stuff into the input uh, field, it changes. Like we 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 do this every single day. Now look at this. Uh, I'm making I'm making used input value, which is a custom hook. The reason it's a custom hook, uh, the way you make a custom hook is you use the use keyword in front of whatever you're gonna call it. It doesn't mean anything. It just shows that it's a it's a hook. So we make used input value, same value and unchanged, and I'm passing it in to the app function and still doing the same thing. Now, the, now this is where it gets really cool. I made a custom um, used input value, and I returned value and unchanged, and I'm doing all the handling inside the actual state of used, used input value. And I just, 
deconstruct value throughout into input, and it just it works. Um, next, this is a uh, real world real real world example. I'm using um, I'm creating a use fetch hook to like grab information and throw it throw it around all throughout my app. I actually made this like. 20 minutes before the talk, so if this looks kind of weird, don't yell at me. Um, next, all right, let's talk about use effect. So we know component did mount, component did update, and component will unmount. There's a lot of technical methods that um, React uses to like, you know, mess around with the components. So these components get very messy because you have to put a different type of lock, like multiple types of logic inside each lifecycle method. Like you can have a, a binding logic, a fetch logic, all inside the components you found. And it gets really messy really quickly if you're not careful. And that's where use effect, and that's where you enter use effect. Um, use effect runs on every single component we render. So if the logic is fired, they will re-render re on every single one. Uh, and you can have as many use effects as you want, but if you don't, uh, if you don't want logic to run, what if you don't want logic to uh, run on every single render? Um, use effect also accepts a secondary argument, which is an array, and um, it tells when to re-render a comp when to call use effect and when not to call use effect. If you look at the sec uh, the second value, it's an array with count. If count is updated, use effect will fire. If count is never updated, use effect won't ever fire. So now this is where component did mount works. If you want it to only render on the first render, pass it in an empty array. So that means it's gonna, it's gonna see, oh, there's, it checks it the first time and it never changes again, so use effect never fires again. Um, so now, uh, what happens when we want to unmount these uh, components? Like, you know, you don't want to have like data leaks all throughout your app because you forgot to unbind something. Um, the cool thing is, if you have a return value and you have your uh, unbind logic inside that return value, when the when the component unmounts, that return function will fire, and uh, the uh, for this example, the onclick function will, will unbind. So um, there's a rule. There's a couple of rules for using use effect and use state throughout your components. One is uh, always call your hooks at the very top of the function, never inside loops or if conditions and whatnot. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's basic. Yeah, we'll actually get into that in a little bit. And um, only use in them inside of the function components because by following this rule, you ensure that all stateful logic in components is clearly visible to the source code. Uh, clearly, that's from the docs. So, um, so if you look at this, this is a perfect example of it. Use state depend like state in a in a hook depends on where you call it. So. Like if you look at use state one to uh, Mary, and then the use effect, and then use state again, and then use effect, they're firing in the same order. So the component knows where each state lives on each every single re-render. Now, look at this. If we, uh, for some reason, we commented out that use effect, everything starts breaking because now um, it goes to the second use state and it, th it thinks two, it thinks it's the second one, but it's actually three, and it fails to read the surname and all that stuff. It gets, uh, that's how you, you know, start a fire in your app, so don't do this. Um, what you can do is, if you need to do conditional logic, do it inside the uh, use effect uh, function. So inside there, this is completely valid, and the cool thing is uh, the React team has actually made linters, and like, if you do it the other way, it'll like, be like, don't do this, stop, what are you doing? Um, so now let's talk about use context. Um, so we know um, prop rolling is very bad. Um, what is prop rolling? You know, when you have state that you want to pass down to the 17th child or whatever, you would have to pass uh, state to the next child and the next child and the next child and the next child. It's great if you have like two components, but if you have like a lot of components, it gets very, very confusing and you should not do it. Um, so that's where the context API comes in. The context API is not part of React Hooks. It came out like last summer, I believe, and um, it, it was the React React team's um, attempt to do away with Redux, and they try every year, and like it, they think they've solved it, but then like some guys like, wait, it doesn't work this way, and they go back to square one. But like the context API basically takes a uh, you set a context with whatever value, 
and it, has, it gives you a provider and a consumer. And at the very top level of your app, you have a um, number contact, for example, and you give it a provider. This is very akin to like a store in Redux. And in, in some random component, you can pass through a consumer, and there you, you have uh, access to value. So now the answer is 42 in some component, like, like 35 levels down in the tree. So that's, this is not part of the book, by the way. But, um, but see, this is where you can use use context, and this is part of the books. Um, the first part's the same thing. You give it a provider, and you know it has, you give it the same value of 42, but in some random other component, you, you, you call use context. And over there, you uh, now have access to that same value that you, you set before. Next, use reducer. It's very familiar if you've used Redux before. Um, use reducer takes in a reducer. It takes in an initial state and spits out state variables and dispatches the function that uses to like you know combine the two states into one. So um, what you would use use reducer in place of a complex state management when complex state management is required, such as needing to know what the previous state was. So as you can see, you know same thing as Redux. There's a switch and cases and like. When, when a dispatch function is called, you would ask for the action type, and then you would do whatever you would need to do in that, in that, in that context, and get the correct amount, of, the correct state back. Um, so, use reducer and use context. Uh, can it replace Redux? Uh, I think so, but uh, we shall see. So, that's, uh, that was the slide portion of my talk. I want to show you a, a little quick app that I'm building. It's really ugly looking. There's no styling involved, but like, um, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. All right, so it's a it's a little game that you guys might know. It's a very niche game that some people might know, some people might not know. What? Uh, what? Oh, sorry, wrong. Sorry. It's Pokemon. <laughs> and you can uh, literally. By the way, these Pokemon that I'm fighting. They have actual stats and everything because I found this great API. And uh, this Chansey is actually in class. So, uh, <laughs> so, see, like, Mew died, now Pikachu comes out and can get locked as well. And this, by the way, this is still using 100% of this app is uh, hooks. So, uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's React hooks. And I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this has hooked you guys. Any questions? Yes, Nick. Uh, you can go for it. No, any, any questions? Yes. yes. Um, I see that you're using error functions inside your ethics when you're teaching your object to measure the physical issue. Mm -hmm. um, why does that hurt performance and behavior? That's a very good question, and I will find out the answer, and I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm very new to books, so like, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, yes, me. So, uh, Redux, one of the kind of, I guess, allures of it is that it's a snapshot of the UI at mm -hmm. a particular point in time. So do, is there any sort of mechanism in React Hooks that can give you a snapshot of the internal state of use context, use reducer, et cetera, at a particular point in time? I could be wrong, but I don't think so. But I could be wrong. Like I haven't I haven't researched enough of it to like know that, but I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. So it about to his question, is there no solution for time travel debugging of your application level state? I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, cool. But uh, yeah.
Yeah, 
was actually made most of like I like I have like three credit cards in my bank account. Yeah. 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 Yeah.